Thank you, Mr. Assistant President. I lead for the opposition on the Parliamentary Budget Officer Amendment Bill 2018. Um, we will be supporting the legislation, but we have amendments that we will move in the committee stage. On this side of the House, we are very aware of the important role the Parliamentary Budget Officer plays. Uh, it's a role that we support and believe in, and we know everyone in this chamber should do so as well. Um, but the amendments will be to strengthen and enhance the institution. Um, we know that the reason the Parliamentary Budget Office is so critical because it provides or should provide a very real opportunity for the Parliament as a whole to propose, identify, flesh out uh, policies and proposals uh, that are in the public interest. Now, at the moment, obviously, the only two clients of the Parliamentary Budget Office are the leader of the major parties. But we have a vision for the Parliamentary Budget Office more akin to what you see uh, in Canberra and, of course, what is now in place in Victoria, where it is a facility, a resource available to each member and all parties to assist them develop their policies and proposals, uh, to do so in a way that is responsible, uh, to do so in a way that enables them to test their ideas and to have them fleshed out and where uh, they don't get to the pitch of the ball or they are flawed to be able to review, revise and improve on those because we recognise that that is ultimately what is in the public interest. It's not in the interest of the community that we seek to serve if parties have flawed proposals or ideas uh, that are put towards or put before the community. So we think uh, we know it's a great privilege to come into these chambers of parliament. We know it's a great privilege, particularly in the major parties, to be able to propose uh, policies for government. And we think that there should be a proper full-time parliamentary budget office in place available to all members to rigorously test and enable them to analyse and prosecute and evaluate their policy proposals and ideas. Because to be able to have policies that are properly thought out, developed, tested, critiqued and improved is ultimately what should be in the public interest and that's something we should all, we should all support. Mm -hmm. um, when we aspire to be part of a government, our policies should be things that bring about positive change uh, in a realistic way. And to do that, we need to ensure that they're affordable, that the state and its communities can pay for them and that there are not obviously unintended consequences. And the PBO process that we envisage will certainly uh, enable that. I note that recently the Victorian Labor government has implemented also a full-time parliamentary budget office. Now Victoria, its parliament and government is much smaller than ours, but it obviously is one that understands the benefits of having an independent, and fully fledged and fully operational and properly staffed uh, parliamentary budget office in place, not only in the lead up to an election, but in an ongoing way. Um, and we, we, we make the point, as the Shadow Treasurer did in the other place, that parliaments are not just for six months before an election, they're for four years, uh, and that issues arise that need responses from governments and oppositions and other parties and members in the meantime. and there need to be appropriate mechanisms through which members and parties can develop appropriate public responses to those issues. And we think that a parliamentary budget office is a, a very important mechanism to do that. As I indicated, the parliamentary budget office is fully operational in the Commonwealth Parliament. Uh, members of the Labor opposition, and indeed any other party or member, can put forward proposals to be critiqued, reviewed and costed. Um, and that's, that, that is something that should be available to all members uh, in, in this place. Now, on this side of the House, despite the taunts from those opposite uh, over the last eight years, uh, New South Wales Labor in this state does actually take fiscal responsibility very seriously. It's not a debating point, but it's a matter of record that in the 16 budgets delivered under various <coughs> Labor governments, only two were in deficit. <coughs> 14 years of surpluses not propped up by privatisation proceeds. 
um, but through the diligent and hard work of reining in both debt and public expenditure. And the, and the, and the fact is, so we, we do have the track record for fiscal discipline. We take that very seriously. And we know that if you fail that test in the community, you will not be given the opportunity to govern the state in the public interest. So the, as the Shadow Treasurer made the point in his contribution in the other place, we have established our own expenditure review committee to review cost, analyse and critique all of our policies and proposals. And when the Parliamentary Budget Office tables its operational plan, the opposition will be ready to go with policies to be costed through the PBO process. Um, we will be utilising the skills and the expertise of the PBO to ensure that the policies we put before the people of this state in the days, weeks and months before the March election uh, uh, enable the public to have the confidence that a future Labor government understands and respects fiscal discipline and it will be part of everything that we, we do and put before the people. Um, the opposition leader and the shadow treasurer have already met with the parliamentary budget officer and the staff and have been actively engaging with them uh, in the lead up uh, to the election. Um, but again, what we do learn from the previous time um, was that, uh, and this was not a reflection on the parliamentary budget office or its staff, but because it was only being geared up prior to the election, because there were issues to do with staffing, it was the case that the opposition got fairly jammed in the lead up to the election that um, many of our policies and costings weren't really available, uh, hadn't been processed until in some cases uh, fe the February before the election. That's um, not democratic, it's not fair. And one of the benefits again of having a permanently established and operational PBO will be that 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 jamming effect on an opposition or any non-government party uh, should not and will not happen. Because ultimately, yes, the government of the day gets a tactical advantage. Ultimately, it doesn't stop the opposition putting its policies before the community, but it is anti-democratic and it does do ultimately harm to confidence uh, in politicians and in political processes more generally. Um, so we think you know that's that's not a good thing, and that should be uh, made uh, a factor of the past. So we think um, it's uh, it's very important to have a permanent parliamentary budget office in place. As I indicated that, um, as we did in the other place, we have a series uh, of amendments which we would uh, invite um, the government, because obviously the government and the opposition. Um, are the parties that are the clients at the par of the Parliamentary Budget Office at the moment, but we would ask all parties in this place to give open-minded and fair consideration to our four amendments um, because uh, they will substantially improve the Parliamentary Budget Office uh, as an institution. The first of the amendments will change the length of time that a government agency has to respond to requests. The bill currently provides for 10 days. We propose to reduce that to five days if the request is made before the commencement of the care pay taker period. Um, uh, there is no need for a response to take 10 days. Uh, most of the proposals shouldn't even take anywhere near uh, the five days, and that is because um, a, a number of uh, members of the Labor Caucus and the Shadow Ministry have worked in government uh, some of us have been public servants, uh, as well as undertaken other callings. But um, many, many proposals have, if you like, standardised costs, although they don't take into account every variable. There are average and standard costs for things like schools, hospitals of a certain classification, um, uh, a public sector worker, whether it's a teacher, a nurse, or a police officer. Um, so many proposals will be very simple and easy to provide the costings that ultimately will be sought and delivered by the Parliamentary Budget Office. 
Um, so we think uh, the reduction from five, 10 days to five days is, is fair and reasonable. Um, we also propose that the length of time that a government agency responds uh, to a request be changed from six days to five business days if the request is made on or after the caretaker period, which is also a simple proposal, um, because during the caretaker period, much of the day-to-day -day operations of government um, do not go at the same pace, because obviously, uh, if you like, it's a, it's a status quo situation. There are no new policies or initiatives being pursued by the executive government, which takes up a lot of day-to-day -day operational capacity in public sector agencies. That will be missing because the government in caretaker uh, will not be undertaking those new activities and so there is no reason why the permanent public service should not be able to produce the information in the time uh, that we are being that we are proposing in that second amendment the third amendment relates to whether or not a government agency holds any information we are simply requiring the government to respond to the opposition in two business days if it does not hold any of the information requested. Um, uh, our experience in the past was that um, the official response would take every day of the allotted time and where that ultimate response is we don't have the information, uh, that causes the opposition lost time, lost opportunities. Um, where the government agency does not have the information it should have a, a, a lesser period of time and we think two business days is very fair and reasonable. Our final proposal um, uh, deals with the issue of whether the Parliamentary Budget Office should provide copies of material to the Secretary of the Department of Premier and Cabinet, uh, ostensibly to enable the Department to prepare <coughs> material for an incoming government. Now, um, I was, uh, I was an opposition staffer the last time the Labor Party won government from opposition in 1995. And um, there was absolutely no need for uh, the public service to have um, documents of this sensitivity. Um, uh, the, the permanent public service delivers uh, the package for the incoming government, the blue books. Um, based on publicly announced policies put forward by the opposition during the campaign. Uh, that is done professionally and competently and diligently by the Permanent Public Service and it's uh, those who are given the custody and control of, of those institutions. And we have every expectation uh, that they will do a competent and diligent job this time. But they do not need the information provided to and generated by the Parliamentary Budget Office. Um, that should really be a matter between the opposition and the Parliamentary Budget Office. And obviously, the Parliamentary Budget Office has its own statutory charter uh, to make public the costings of the government and the opposition that have been publicly released during the campaign. If you like the, the, the scorecard, uh, what each of the government and the opposition's policies will cost in a net sense the taxpayers um, of, of our state. Uh, that is all. Uh, the executive government and its agencies, typified or led by the Secretary of the DPC, does not need that material. And in fact, giving the Secretary of the Department of Premier and Cabinet that material strikes at the independence of the Parliamentary Budget Office and also you know, runs the risk of, of seeking to compromise the very purpose for which the PBO was created and that is so that the opposition has um, the capacity to have its policies tested and costed in an independent way um, without the anxiety that often what are works in progress policies that are uh, that are evolved in response to PBO feedback uh, are not being fed to the elected government for it to seek a tactical advantage at what is obviously a, a sensitive time in the democratic cycle. Now, this is not a reflection on the current Secretary of the Department of Premier and Cabinet, but the DPC being so closely identified with the executive government of the day, 
if there were to be a leak of sensitive information, obviously that institution would be implicated uh, if it was to be receiving these sensitive materials. And there was an apprehension during the last election about whether or not, because the PBO obviously had to liaise with relevant departments and agencies, whether there would be a leak of materials uh, of opposition policies uh, at that level. And I'm very happy to say that as far as I'm aware, there was not. Uh, the PBO and each of the staff in the various agencies of the state with whom they had to liaise were absolutely professional and maintained the confidence of all parties. That is vital if the PBO is to have value um, and it's vital that it does so to ensure that the democratic process in the lead up to the election is not compromised. So we think it's very important that uh, the Secretary of the Department of Premier and Cabinet not be provided with this information. Uh, and the reason advanced for it to have that information is simply not necessary. It does not need that information in order to prepare the blue books for the incoming government, whether it's the existing government or whether uh, the opposition um, is given the great honour of forming the next administration. And we, we understand uh, the mountain we have to climb, the, the difficulty it is to find the additional seats, but on this side of the House we take nothing for granted. But whoever is given that honour of being the government of this state, um, we know that the public service will have prepared the plan for the incoming government based on announced policies. They do not need this material, uh, and providing this material uh, runs a very significant risk to the institution of the Parliamentary Budget Office. So um, we don't oppose the legislation, we support it as, I, as we support the institution of the Parliamentary Budget Office. Um, the amendments we've put forward are to improve the operation of that institution and again to maintain its integrity and the integrity of the process that it oversees, which is of course the, the costings uh, of the policies put forward by each of the government and the opposition. And it's particularly that last one, uh, making sure that the, se the Secretary of the Department of Premier and Cabinet doesn't get that information, that is very important to maintain that integrity. As I said, it's not a reflection on the institution or the current leadership of that institution, it's just that that institution is so closely identified with the existing government, whoever the government of the day is. Um, and it should just ought not have that access to that, the information passing between non-government parties and the Parliamentary Budget Office for the purposes of evolving, testing and developing, costing those policies that are ultimately put before the people. Um, so with, the, with those observations, I'd urge the government and indeed all parties to support our reasonable uh, amendments.